Well, welcome along to the final instalment of Lease Hold Made Simple Week. All this week, we have been talking with our friends and colleagues at Anthony Gold Solicitors about the topic of leasehold from the landlord perspective. And all, all this week, Ian, we've been saying that this is such a trending topic because there's so much going on in the leasehold sector. And probably the biggest uh, kind of discussion point is the government coming in and looking at leasehold reform. Now, um, really, we're going to talk about that now in more detail. You've actually been in, in, in kind of um, part of this process, haven't you? What kind of prompted the government to step in? Well, um, I think it runs from uh, the number of complaints that um, the, the housing ombudsman was probably receiving from leaseholders and the lack of solutions um, and the, the apparent um, contrast between uh, what people perceived as uh, home ownership and leasehold ownership because the the two types of ownership are diametrically opposed um, you know people buying flats think they're buying a home where essentially they're buying a lease for a fixed period uh, which has strict terms written on it as to you know how you use it and uh, and uh, you know that and that's where the, the that's where the two things conflict people it doesn't fit with home ownership. People think, oh, it's my home, I, can, I should be able to do what I want. I should be able to rent it out. Um, I should be able to, you know, knock, knock a wall down and, and, and make a through lounge or I should be able to put, you know, an extension on the back if I own the garden. It's not that simple with leaseholds. So that's why the government have stepped in. Um, and uh, also we, we've spoken in, in, earlier, in, in earlier videos about the ground rent scandal. Mm -hmm. That's also brought um, the, the, you know, the possibility and the, the, you know, the, the call for reform to, to, to a head. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've seen um, over the last uh, two, two years, two and a half years, is uh, uh, consultation uh, with uh, the public um, and two reports written by uh, the, the Law Commission. Uh, the first of those reports came out uh, in, two, in September 2018, mm -hmm. and what the Law Commission looked at was uh, how, how um, they looked at you know how complex um, and sometimes perverse the lease, leasehold ownership can be, and how they could simplify um, lease extensions and uh, collective enfranchisement claims, mm -hmm. um, because um, the complications that the existing regime uh, has has imposed uh, for flats, for leasehold flats, for houses, leasehold houses, has just added tiers of um, expense and argument. So people are incurring, um, you know, thousands of pounds of professional costs arguing about um, whether they've got entitlement, uh, how much it should cost, um, and even lawyers have fallen foul of like pitfalls in, in a very complicated process. I mean, um, the leasehold reform, um, the area was so grey at, at, at one point when the legislation, um, when the 93 Act was introduced, the leasehold reform, uh, Housing and Urban Development Act 93, when that came in, some of the, it was so unclear or grey as to how that act applied in, in a lot of scenarios that we needed a, a ton of a ton of litigation to clarify um, what exactly was meant by um, sections of that act, that that statute. Um, one example um, was um, you know where, for instance, a freeholder fails to serve a counter notice. The act says that the court, uh, so you essentially the leaseholder might apply for a vesting order to the court. And now the 93 Act specified that uh, the court may make an order determining the terms of that lease extension or that collective enfranchisement claim on the terms in the tenant's notice. Now the, the use of the term may is particularly grey and of course there was a number of cases on this issue um, and then you know, eventually there was a Court of Appeal decision, uh, it was the uh, global uh, Willingale uh, decision which, which essentially said it may is must and the court doesn't have a discretion. But um, just a classic example of how grey the area is and how um, litigation has basically been, lit litigation is cl clarified and, uh, and, and kind of determined and fixed in stone what, what, how, this, how the mechanisms to extend your lease, how the mechanisms to buy your freehold apply mm -hmm. and uh, it could be much simpler. And then, the, you know, people question, particularly when they've, you know, they buy a flat and they've discovered the lease isn't, as, at least needs extending or there's a problem, they question like, why do I need to own the flat for two years before I can, mm -hmm. I can exercise my statutory rights and apply to, apply to extend the lease or remedy a defect um, by virtue of, 
that, that, that very similar process. So the government looked at this and they came up with a range of uh, proposals that are going to, um, well, try to balance um, things and uh, they're, they're going to try and um, abolish the two-year ownership rule for flats so people can just go and serve notices. Um, they're trying to add transparency to the process, particularly on the valuation side so that people um, uh, so there's some certainty around what, what, what it's going to cost you to extend your lease or buy your freehold. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're going to um, try and uh, they're trying to um, begin prescribed notices um, so that it's less likely there's going to be errors and mistakes that can be relied on to invalidate notices and force people to reserve and to expend lots of money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on a, uh, you know, pr protracting a process really that should be quite simple. Mm -hmm. And then um, so. That those were the first proposals that the Law Commission came up with in 2018, and um, you know, it really was about um, you know making the process simpler, removing the minimum requirements um, uh, of, a, of having the flat for two years. Um, also, they were talking about for, for you know for buying the freehold, um, having the right for people who weren't involved in a collective enfranchisement coming in afterwards, because that you know, the, the the whole concept of collective enfranchisement when it was um, when it was dreamt up by uh, the government was that um, everyone had to be everyone ought to have been invited to the party and there had to be called uh, there had to be an RTM notice circulated. Uh, it's a right, right to, to manage. Right to no, it's a right to enfranchise. Oh, okay. That that section of the act actually was never brought into force. So there is provision in the ninety three act that says, oh well, you have to invite everyone, but that never came into force, so it doesn't apply. So you have a situation where um, groups of leaseholders and blocks, um, by majority, because there's you know they they can outvote people, can buy the freehold to the detriment of the neighbours and take control. Um, so the government are going to try and stop that as well. They're going to. So we we have situations, um, uh, you know, over the last ten. 20 years where, where people bring in franchisement claims as a majority group rule, they buy the freehold, they exclude people, so people can come in afterwards as a right to join, and they're, also, they're going to restrict people uh, enfranchising within a, you know, a five year period of the enfranchisement um, concluding, so that it stops that ping pong enfranchisement that's gone on in some of the London blocks. Um, they're also, I mean, one of the other complications that we find, and you know, that really is a bar on enfranchisement, is the cost. And um, if you serve a notice on most um, portfolio landlords to buy their freehold interest, they're always going to argue it's worth substantially more than uh, it's worth, and they're going to say, well, there's development potential in the roof. Um, you know, if it's a smaller block, they might say, well, there's, potent there's, there's development potential at the rear or in some retained parts. Now, what the government's proposed, those, well, under the current regime, those parts will be priced up, and, uh, and if there's disagreement on what you pay, it goes to the tribunal and there's arguments around the likelihood of getting planning, and, you know, there's a discount as some eventually pay for those parts, but it's still considerable. Now, what the government are proposing, if the landlord is going to, in these reforms, the 2018 reforms, if the landlord is saying there's development potential in the loft or in other retained parts, or even there's arguments even to pay more if you can convert a building from three or four flats into a house and it's worth more as a house than as, as three or four separate units. If the landlord's going to run that argument to enhance its, its premium under the new proposals, um, they wouldn't get paid for that, de that potential development um, um, value until the leaseholders actually at some future point did it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, people are paying for things that they may never use under the current process. You're paying for the potential in the loft space, and you may have no intention of using it. Now, that that's something the government is going to stop. And um, so then we had a another period of consultation, and the Law Commission have come back. In fact, on the 9th of January uh, this year, and uh, in this second paper, they looked at uh, some of the options in how to make. Um, how to make lease extensions and uh, collective enfranchisements uh, uh, less expensive. Now, whether they're going to do that, because the, the, the course there's always a, a balance between the freeholders' uh, rights and mm -hmm. leaseholders' rights, and you know, you know, and, and, you know, eroding one side costs the, costs those individuals um, money from their from their asset base, etc. How, how they how they're going to do that is still really the subject of, of debate. Um, so some of the things that have come out of this um, 2020 um, uh, report 
are uh, the possibility of introducing three schemes uh, for uh, valuing lease extensions. Now, um, can't say which one might apply. The first scheme um, would um, mean that uh, leaseholders extending in two, three, four, five years' time, and this if this legislation came in, would not have to pay marriage value uh, or hope value uh, on enfranchisement cases. Uh, might explain what that is. Actually, hope value is where um, you're paying um, marriage value for non-participating flats that may extend at a future point. So that scheme one is a possibility. Probably, in my view, not that possible. Um, scheme two is where um, you, you don't you, you you just don't pay hope value, but you'll pay the marriage value. Um, and scheme three is where everything stays the same, but the government are going to bring in. Um, they're going to bring in some tweaks, so the valuation process for the enfranchisement claims and for the lease extensions will be run on the same basis, but they're going to have prescribed rates that apply um, into the calculations. So, um, so how you capitalise the ground rent will have a prescribed rate, what, um, what relativity you use because of the term left on the lease, that will be fixed. You know, there's a suggestion they're going to bring in um, online, cal you know, an online calculator that adds certainty to what people pay, or even uh, even a suggestion which helps the the owner's ground rent um, situation, the ground rent scan. A suggestion that the amount of ground rent that's put through these calculators is is capped. So if you've got flats with like massive ground rents, um, if that you know, w w with these tweaks on the scheme three proposal, um, it's going to it's going to you know, substantially reduce what they'll pay. Mm -hmm. um, but then you've got this question of when those changes will come in, mm -hmm. what parts of these, you know, what aspects of the proposals are actually going to be um, put, you know, put on the statute books. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, th there's a lot being done and there's, there's certainly going to be reform in this area and, you know, to watch this space kind of situation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, What's you know the actual hard um, changes um, and the you know the actual reform that's going to be implemented that's still up for um, question mm. still still uncertain. Mm. Still a lot to play for, and a obviously for, a lot yeah. of different parties with a lot of different agendas is what I'm hearing from you there as yeah. well. Because obviously the the, the freeholder has a different um, opinion on it to to the, to the leaseholders. Um, I think. You know, there's also the talk of, uh, you know, common hold as well, which has worked yeah. very well in other countries. Do you see that leasehold will become a thing of the past um, or is it here to stay, but it's going to become more consumer friendly? Well, the common hold, um, again, there was, um, there was, con there was, the Law Commission looked at common hold as well and, um, there was, I think it was, about, it was about two, three, four years. This, there was a uh, an expectation that um, common hold would be the new leasehold, mm -hmm. um, and the more we looked at, the more practitioners and the government and the law commission looked at it, um, the more difficult it became to decide what was what would be acceptable for the for the UK model. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, you have you have different systems in different countries, and I think common hold would be very similar to strata title in Australia or, mm. or the condominium kind of structure mm. in America, where um, you know where where buildings uh, are are kind of run on a collective, mm. so it's almost like a, a democracy for your building. Mm. So um, now the UK traditional um, ownership for leaseholds um, is you have a freeholder, mm -hmm. you you have a lease, and the the freeholder is the go-to guy if you've got problems. So, um, you know, common hold has got its pitfalls as well, and and that's and in fact it does exist. I mean, common hold is on the statute books. Uh, it ca you know it came in with the leasehold reform, common hold leasehold reform act two two thousand and two, mm -hmm. and I think since that that came on on the statute books, we've only had uh, I think about eight or nine uh, common holds created in the country, mm -hmm. and I think. Lenders don't like them, so that that's why it hasn't been replicated everywhere for new bills. Lenders just don't know what it is. Um, mm. So, if you have to to bring common hold in, you need an acceptance from lenders. Good point. Um, to to, so to to say yeah, that's that's good. That's we can get security, valid valid security on on a, on a, on a on a freehold, especially a freehold um, flying freehold section of 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 a building. Because what common hold is is you essentially get. 
a registered title of a part of the building and then um, your lease is basically a charter that applies so it's an agreement between everyone in the building um, as to how you're going to uh, you know you're going to how you're going to get on and how you're going to do maintenance and um, and I suppose the the, the big problem uh, with common hall is that no one quite knows how to, what to put in that charter like you know do you you know if it's if it is if it is flat ownership as a democracy you know sh how do you how do you agree to do works where you know a, a, you know a, a minority or maybe 49% almost a majority can't afford to do works that are necessary to a building mm. um you know where does that line stop so with, with the current leasehold system, you have the landlord's ability to um, to carry out repairs when they're necessary. With common hold, and you have a charter, you almost need agreement, and that's where things become problematic because if you're you're forcing things that maybe your neighbours don't want mm -hmm. on them, costs and expenditure, service charge, and instead of ha instead of them blaming the freeholder in the traditional leasehold system, they're going to be blaming you. Because it was, you know, it was a group meeting, and there was a decision made that we're going to go ahead with these major works. It's going to cost, you know, it's going to cost whatever, and um, maybe you're selling your flat in the morning, and you were against the repairs, um, uh, the works that were proposed because you just want to sell. You don't want to get a big bill, um, but that's not to be taken into account. Um, so, it's it's difficult to know whether common hold can be tweaked to the extent that it's actually viable, whether lenders, there's going to be acceptance from lenders, mm. it, very, very difficult to know. Mm. Indeed, it's, it, is, it is a very kind of ongoing, movable feast, isn't it? Do, yeah. do you have, just as we kind of close our week of themed content out here, Ian, do you have a theory on um, the direction of travel for this? I, I do have a theory. So um, I think that, that, that it's, it's a no-brainer for whatever legislation comes through uh, to abolish ground rents in leases moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, th there is campaigning as well for that to happen uh, with leaseholder groups. And some of the developers have pledged to do that as well moving forward um, for you know, the grant of leasehold houses and flats and some of the, you know, in, you know, in London and uh, you know, in the Midlands, etc. cetera. Um, so that, that's a no brainer. Um, now the valuation exercise. I know a lot of my my surveyor friends are very concerned about the um, the second set of reforms uh, that have come out, the proposed reforms that have come out mm -hmm. in the in in the latest law commission report. Um, a lot of surveyors do a very good job, and they're just feeling they're feeling that you know, that the, the government are simplifying to the extent that they're no longer required. Mm -hmm. Now, whether is that a good or bad thing for? Uh, leaseholders, um, it really depends on the situation. If you have a very simple um, um, transaction uh, where the variables are very static, then I can see the need to have a very simple simple process. You know, almost a almost a fixed process of fixing a price. You know, input the variables, output a price. But sometimes cases are more complicated than that, and they do need. There is an art form in valuing something. And you know, just because the calculator says it's worth this doesn't mean it's worth that. It could be worth more. It could, in fact, it could be worth less. Mm -hmm. um, and I th so, yes, there's. I, I think you need to be very careful what you fix when you're looking at bringing in prescribed rates for capitalising ground rents and prescribed rates for um, uh, relativity. Um, but I, I, I think. You know the industry as a whole is 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 base is getting fed up of, um, of, of the I suppose of valuers um, and tribunals using as you know, too many graphs to justify clients' ends. Um, there are tons and tons of graphs out there that 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 have applied over the years, and every you know every significant decision that comes through from the first tier tribunal or the lands tribunal, um, they make reference to preferencing, uh, an, you know, the, new, the latest graph. It could be the Savills graph. It could have been, mm -hmm. uh, it could be the enfranchisable graph from, um, from, you know, yeah, it could be the enfranchisable graph from Savills. It could be the, the Nesbitt graph. Um, it could, you know, there's this, you know, I think we move away from people trying to create graphs that, create a you know, desirable outcome and pushing that, those, th those, those graphs on, on, on how valuation should be conducted, that's sensible because it just, you know, that's, where, that's where prices tend to swing and, and no one knows whether it's a 10 or a 20 grand lease extension. Um, 
So that that's definitely that that's definitely a no-brainer as well. Um, but uh, so the direction of travel is definitely ground rents are, are, are probably going to be a thing of the past. Valuation will be simplified, but I think it needs to be simplified to the extent that you you, you balance leaseholder and freeholders um, entitlement on premium. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know whether there's a future for common hold. Um, I, 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 that that's less likely. Um, it, it, I think, um, but you know, in five, ten years' time, th things might change. I mean, it really depends on whether lenders are on, are on side, mm. um, and, and and they like that 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 title structure, and and whether you know, the flats that it is implemented on, if if it's something that people roll out, whether it works, mm -hmm. because if it doesn't work, then people aren't gonna gonna adopt it. So what we can really conclude is that we are entering a time of significant change for, for the yeah. leasehold sector. Um, but as always, I think that one thing that does stay constant is to seek professional advice um, with a, a, a legal who's a legal specialist in this area of law. Um, we're partnered with Anthony Gold. They have a leasehold um, uh, department here. Uh, also, uh, we want to mention Alep as well, don't we? Don't we? Because yeah. they, the um, Association of Leasehold Enfranchisement Practitioners, um, can direct you to a specialist uh, uh, expert like Ian, for instance, who is a member of that organisation. They do very important work. They've been part of the consultation. Yeah. Um, I mean, Alep, I think, have, have, oh, have they've changed uh, the law in this area uh, at least one occasion. The, there used to be an old requirement uh, to have uh, the leaseholder sign a notice. Now, where if you, if the leaseholder lack capacity because of you know certain of events and you know that 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 would prevent them from extending a lease. So we, Alep was uh, was at the forefront of bringing in legislation that allows a notice to be signed on authority, mm -hmm. uh, not by the leaseholder. So that that has that's opened up the door for um, you know f for people without capacity who've got deputies to, to actually sign notices to extend mm -hmm. leases. So yeah, they do good work and they are lobbying for change uh, for positive change in the sector. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, they 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 they're, they take a you know that they do take a balanced approach. Uh, Alep are, 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 are for the leaseholder and the freeholder, mm. but they want a fair, a fair position. Um, so, um, th and that's I think that is the that's the, that is that's important. I mean, the government are looking at doing a measured balancing act here. Um, w w whatever changes come in, they're not looking to tip the scales completely in favour of leaseholders. Um, that's just that wouldn't be fair. I mean, I don't think that's the expectation either um, from from people on the leasehold side. They, you know, I mean, I, I'll just conclude by saying leaseholders sometimes need their freeholder to be there and to to to, to run, um, you know, enforcement action or whatever or, or, or major works um, programs on buildings. Um, you know, if if the, if the landlord wasn't doing that, then it would, uh, you know it would boil down to cooperation. Mm -hmm. Um, by you know, hundreds of people in the building potentially. If you have a large building and there needs, there's a, a there's a major works program required. Maybe the roof needs replacing. If you're the freeholder, yes, you can. You have to consult with everyone in the building to do it. But at least you can go and do it. If you were the leaseholders and you've got that that control and you need to get on with the works, how do you get agreement? That's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And even common holds hasn't quite. Um, worked out how that problem will will be solved um, so yeah um, watch the space it surely is but from our perspective that is the end of our week of leasehold made simple i have to thank uh, ian and his colleague lauren for um, sharing their information as part of this week we do hope you've enjoyed it um, if you're watching on youtube of course i must remind you to jump across to propertytribes.com that is where our discussions are hosted and also please do um, click notifications bell if you'd like to receive video updates from this channel um, and just ian thank you so much for yeah. for being part of this and and to your colleague lauren and uh, we'll sign off now and uh, interesting times ahead in the leasehold sector but i think we covered a lot of ground this this uh, this week and uh, it's a topic that I'm sure we'll revisit again in the future. Thank you Vanessa. Thanks. <laughs>